We're going to be looking at the Bible, so if you have your Bible handy nearby that you might want to take a look at the passages we'll be looking at. If not, you'll be able to look at my Bible, and we'll talk about the Scriptures. You might want to write down some of the references so you can look them up later and uh, be able to uh, 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 study what we've talked about a little more thoroughly on your own. I want to talk about deception, and as we approach the return of Jesus Christ, Jesus said something very interesting. The first thing he told us to look for is, Take heed that no man deceive you. This is Matthew 24, verse 4. Take heed that no man deceive you. Then he says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, for many, many years, I have thought that this verse is saying that somebody will maybe be coming, walking down the main street in your town and have a white robe on and claim to be the Messiah. But you know, when you think about that, that person would just probably be laughed at and not many people would be deceived at all. I don't believe it's saying that at all. Let's take a look at what I think it really is saying. And this is Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5. Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name. What does that mean? I believe that many will claim to be Christians and are not. Many will come in my name saying, I'm a Christian. And then saying, I, Jesus, and Christ is speaking here, that I am Christ. In other words, they will recognize that Jesus is Christ, and they will come along claiming that they are Christians, and they'll deceive many because they offer a counterfeit of the gospel message, a message of Jesus plus works, and that message will not save. It's kind of scary, but this is a massive deception. Almost every church out there could be qualified by this and if the message of the gospel is not correct, then these many that will claim that they are Christians and will acknowledge that Jesus is Christ are obviously misleading and deceiving many people. You know, the problem with a deceived person is that they don't know that they're deceived or they wouldn't be deceived. Think about that. It's kind of heavy to think about but a deceived person doesn't know that they're deceived or they wouldn't be deceived. And so deception is a subtlety. And, you know, this description would fit the denomination I was raised in and maybe the denomination that you're attending right now because they probably say that they are Christians. You know, this even applies to the cults. The Jehovah's Witnesses claim that they are Christian. And the Jehovah's Witnesses will acknowledge that Jesus is Christ, but yet they deceive many many, with their false message of works for salvation. And I think many, multitudes, the majority of those who claim to be Christian are deceived and are not Christians, and they don't even know it. And here's what's going to happen. I want you to see this, and these are the words of Jesus in Matthew 7, verse 22. He says, many, if you read the context of this chapter, this is in contrast to the few that enter heaven, many will enter in at the broad gate and go to hell. And verse 22, Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day, notice they say, Lord, Lord. Notice they acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord. And then, notice they make reference to their obedience to the Lordship of Christ. They say, look at what we've done. Lord, Lord, we know that you're the Lord, and we have preached in your name. We, in your name, have cast out demons. And in your name, we have done many wonderful works. But look at what it says in verse 23. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Now, look at that carefully, because he didn't say, I once knew you and I lost you. It says here, I never knew you. I never knew you. You were never saved. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Wow. You know, most churches teach exactly this, that you have to live the Christian life and that you have to be a disciple of Christ or recognize the Lordship of Christ in order to be saved. But notice where Lordship salvation will take you. 
it'll take you to hell. These people were lost. Why? Because they didn't say, Lord, Lord, didn't we trust that you died at Calvary's cross and by your death and shed blood paid our sin debt in full and was buried and that you rose again from the dead? If they'd have said that, Jesus would have said, come on in. Notice they're talking about what they have done. Why we did this and we did that and we did the other. We preached in your name. We healed in your name. We did wonderful works in your name. Sorry, wrong answer. It's not what you do for God that saves it's what God did for you at the cross of Calvary. If you could have done something to gain entrance into heaven, Jesus could have stayed in heaven and never had to die at the cross of Calvary. Jesus died because there is no other way. And only through the blood of Christ can you be saved. I love what the hymn writer wrote when he said, What can wash away my sin? The answer is nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. And yet, in most churches, when you really get down where the rubber meets the road, they say, well, I have to live the Christian life. And the new spin on this today is all of this talk about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I believe you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but that is a consequence of trusting Christ. You become born again, God becomes your father, you become his son or daughter, and you're forever related to him. And by the way, when I was born into my earthly family, my mom and dad, uh, I, I became their son. And I was their son whether I was obedient or whether I was disobedient. I'm still their son. My dad is alive, my mother has slipped into eternity, but I'm still their son. I'll always be the son of my mother and my dad. The same thing is true when you trust Christ as Savior. You become born again. God becomes your father, and you're his son or daughter, whether you're obedient or whether you're not obedient. That doesn't change your relationship. Your relationship is eternal. But some of the biggest names in the country today, and many churches that use the term relationship, talk about a cooperative venture, where if you cooperate with God that then God will be pleased to continue your relationship into eternity. But if you do not cooperate with God and do things that are contrary to his will, that he will not continue your relationship into eternity. And that makes it a salvation by works. That's exactly what we're reading about here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. That you have to say, Lord, Lord, and then be obedient to that lordship. And these people were obedient to that lordship, they acknowledged it and were obedient to it. And they said, we preached in your name and we healed in your name and we did wonderful works in your name. And Christ said, I'm sorry. I never knew you. You were never one of mine. You were never saved. I never saved you. Why? Because you were trying to save yourself. You were being the Savior. You were counting on the things that you did in order to gain entrance into heaven when it is nothing of you. I love what the other hymn writer wrote when he said, Just as I am, I come without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Can you see the contrast? These people aren't saying, I'm coming just like I am, a sinner, condemned, headed for hell, and I trust in your death and shed blood as the means of my salvation. They're saying, No, I have this plea, I have that plea. I'm telling you, Lord, I did this and I did that. The hymn writer had it right and said, Just as I am, I come without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. I hope you're following what I'm saying because this is the difference between heaven and hell. This is the difference between whether you're saved or not. Many will come and maybe you're one of them. And you'll say, I'm a Christian. I recognize that Jesus is Christ. I would call Jesus Lord, Lord, and yet you're deceived because you have heard a false plan of salvation, which is a mixing of what Christ did plus what you do. It's some cooperative venture. Jesus didn't say that you and I cooperate with him to be saved. We simply trust what he has done. 
Let me share with you a wonderful verse in the book of Hebrews. And it says in Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus Christ, in verse 3 of Hebrews 1, being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. This is God in human flesh, Jesus Christ, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Look, look at this phrase here. When he had what? By himself. It doesn't say with our help or with the help of the church or with the help of our family or with the help of our neighbors or with the help of Mary or with the help of Joseph or with the help of a priest or minister or rabbi. Notice what it says. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus didn't need our help. Jesus never claimed to need our help. He by himself purged our sins. We're saved on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To be saved, our part is zero. His part is all. Jesus paid our sin debt in full. Let me go over to John's Gospel. Here's a verse that's probably familiar to you. And this is verse 6 of John chapter 14. Jesus said here, I am the way. He didn't say you and I are the way, or your church and I are the way, or Mary and I are the way, or Joseph and I are the way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And look at this. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Not me plus somebody else. Jesus alone is the Savior. If you're thinking that you have to do some type of a cooperative work and, and, and do something to participate in the salvation other than trusting in the finished work of Christ at Calvary, my friend, you're not going to go to heaven. In fact, the Bible says Christ will count zero for you. Let me have you look with me at the book of Galatians where Paul, the apostle, says this about those who would attempt to be saved by any human work. It says here in verse 4 of Galatians 5, Christ is become of how much effect? My Bible says no effect. No effect unto you. Who is he speaking to? Whosoever of you are justified by works or by the law. He says you are fallen from grace. The ones who are attempting to be saved by Christ plus their works and their cooperative effort will go to hell. Christ will count nothing for them. Paul says in verse 5 of Galatians chapter 5, we, including himself in that we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope or the expectation of righteousness. How? By faith. By faith. Not by works. But those that are attempting to be saved by works, Christ will count nothing for them. They will not be saved. I have everlasting life. I received it at the moment I believed. And that's what the Bible teaches, that your sins have been paid for, past, present, and future, by Christ's death at the cross. When you trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, God saves you at that instant. And from that point on, you possess everlasting life. The Bible says in John 3.16, Whosoever believeth in Christ should not perish, but have, present tense verb, everlasting life. If you have everlasting life right now, and according to the Bible, if you've trusted Jesus alone as your Savior, that you receive eternal life at the moment you believe, and you have it, what kind of life would you have tomorrow? Well, it would be eternal. What about next week? It would be eternal. What about next year? It would be eternal. What about 10 years from now? It would be eternal. What about 100 years from now? It would still be eternal, wouldn't it? What about a million years from now? Still be eternal. Or God made a serious mistake in calling it eternal life when he should have called it probation instead of salvation. He should have called it temporary life instead of eternal life. He should have called it a trial period instead of what it really is, that your sins are forgiven forever and ever and ever and ever. Christ not only did not need your help, your help would contaminate God's plan of salvation. Many will say, many will say, I'm a Christian. Many will come in my name saying, 
I am Christ. They'll acknowledge that Christ is Christ and that he is the Lord. And then they'll attempt by their works to be saved and they won't be saved at all. I'm pleading for the souls of men because I believe most of Christianity is deceived. It is a mass deception. I don't care what church you call it. Most churches today, we're in a time of apostasy where most churches teach Christ plus something of yourself will get you to heaven. Whereas the Bible says Jesus alone saves you. Again, let me remind you of those great hymns. What can wash away my sin? The hymn writer wrote, nothing but the blood. What about the hymn, Just As I Am? I come without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. What about Jesus paid it all? All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it as white as snow. I'm afraid a lot of people that claim to be Christian would have to rewrite the song and say, Jesus paid only part, I'll pay part myself. My friend, if you paid for one sin, you'd go to hell. You don't want to pay for part yourself. You want to accept the full payment that Jesus made at the cross. And the moment you do, God will save you. You know, right now, wherever you might be, if you haven't understood this before now, perhaps you need right now to trust Jesus as your Savior. I find so many people that were raised in church, and I'm one of them. I was confirmed, baptized, homogenized, capsized, simonized, you name it. I went through it. I wasn't saved. It wasn't till I trusted Jesus alone, just like the dying thief, just simply trusted Jesus alone and was saved that I got saved. What about you? Could you whisper that prayer between you and the living God? Just tell him, God, I'm a sinner. I don't understand much about the Bible. I believe Jesus Christ died for me and paid for my sins in full by his death and shed blood at the cross. I trust him right now to save me as my only hope of heaven. And the Lord will save you the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. 